first of all, without uh, violating anyone's HIPAA, uh, who in the audience has IPF? All right, good representation. Uh, who in the audience has another form of fibrotic lung disease? Okay. Next question, who has had a lung transplant? Okay, so we've got a few people there. And who is on the list to have a, a lung transplant? No one. Okay. This is my last and po possibly my toughest question. Who wants to have a transplant? Really? Well, maybe after my talk you'll change your mind. Uh, <laughs> okay. All right. Well, you know, it's all about education and knowing what you're going to be getting yourselves into if you do have a transplant. So that's what I'm going to try and cover. Um, this slide describes the course of IPF, which is really unpredictable. You can have uh, deteriorations even from being functionally quite normal. Uh, and that's a difficulty not only managing patients, but in clinical trials and knowing who should be listed or when they should be listed for lung transplantation. A typical uh, talk that I have with patients who come in with IPF, as opposed to other patients, is you're doing well now, but we don't know if you're going to behave like this at some point. So because we don't know and cannot predict how your disease is going to behave, let's do a lung transplant of L, put the safety net in place in, cl in case you do have an acute and sudden deterioration, we can put you on the list fairly expeditiously. So what we talk about in the context of transplant is not wanting to do patients when they're too well, not waiting for when they're too sick either, but we want to catch patients in this window of opportunity for transplant. And unfortunately, sometimes the nature of IPF is such that patients will go through this window very quickly, and hence the value of having a transplant evaluation in hand to save time and place patients on the list expeditiously. Uh, I'm not going to talk to each of this, each of these slides, but the, the upshot of this is that um, we're doing more transplants, we're doing patients who are older, and whichever way you're looking, you look at it, there's still a donor to recipient imbalance, and that's something that we work actively on to try and improve the donor supply. One of the things that is relatively new is this concept of ex vivo lung perfusion. I thought I'd show you an example of that because you can see some nice healthy lungs outside the human body being ventilated and perfused and getting prepared for lung transplantation. So this is something that originated in Toronto, has worked its way down south, and is one of the ways that we can condition lungs and hopefully expand the donor pool. So there are many steps to having a transplant. Patients obviously need to get referred first. They go through an initial consultation at the transplant center, undergo a comprehensive workup. Their case gets taken before our lung transplant selection committee. You go on the list, you wait, and eventually the transplant happens. So there are many steps along the way. We, uh, every about eight or 10 years, come out with guidelines for transplantation, and th these recently got updated. There's this publication in 2014. The one prior to this was in uh, 2006. And I remember I've been doing lung transplants ever since I was a pulmonary fellow. I was trying to figure out the years. I started as a pulmonary fellow doing lung transplants in California in 1988. So I've been in the field for about 27 years now. And things have changed, uh, not only in transplantation, but how we view candidates as well. So what we try and do, the whole concept behind transplant, and this is a conversation that I typically have with all my patients, is we want to maximize quality of life and we want to maximize quantity of life. And there is an inflection point in the patient's disease course where the likelihood of them surviving longer with a transplant is greater than the likelihood of them surviving with their primary disease. And that's the point that we really go about considering having a lung transplant. When we look at patients, we want to make sure they're in this window of opportunity, but then we look for things that we call contraindications, reasons why patients might not be good candidates for a lung transplant. So we look at all the other major organ systems. We look at the heart, the liver, the kidneys. We look at psychosocial support. I'm not going to go through this exhaustive list. Suffice it to say there are many different elements or things that can knock patients off the list as potential transplant candidates. When I show you the results of transplantation, you'll see it's not the panacea. It's not as easy as putting in one or two lungs and then patients going along their way. There is a certain attrition involved with lung transplantation, and that's why we've got to make sure we choose the best selected candidates. 
kids. Because if you go in with a little bit of kidney disease, we can put you into kidney failure. If you go in with a little bit of liver disease, we can cause liver failure. Transplant is the ultimate stress test, and it can bring out, uh, we hope for the best, but it can bring out the worst in terms of outcomes as well. Uh, so we, we go through this exhaustive list. We have certain criteria with regards to obesity, for example. Psychosocial support is very important because strict compliance with the medical regimen after transplant is absolutely needed. Um, patients need a good social support system as well because it's not a, a one-person effort. You have to rely on family members and friends to, to ensure optimal outcomes. Um, relative contraindications, I'll focus just on the one, and that's age. When I started in the business, uh, we used to say, well, we shouldn't do anyone north of 60. And then it became 65. And in the guidelines from 2006, we said, well, we'll look at patients who are 65 to 70, but they have to be in pristine shape. And now the guidelines say, well, we definitely won't do anyone beyond the age of 75. Um, so it's, it's creeping up over time. I know there are patients even older than 75 who've gone through a transplant. But truthfully, the older you are, the, the worse the outcomes tend to be. So we have to be very careful about, about that as well and not inflicting more harm than good. Um, this is the rest of the list, which I'll just jump through. But to the concept of trying to find that balance between uh, likelihood of dying of your primary disease versus, your, versus having a transplant, this is a typical survival curve uh, of patients with IPF, where we know from the time of presentation it's anywhere from about three and a half to four years. And you put this against the survival with a transplant, and these are outcomes after transplant. So having a transplant is not the panacea. It carries with a, a certain risk of mortality. Uh, the um, median survival is in the range of around six to seven years, meaning that half the patients will be alive and half will have succumbed as a complication of the transplant. And you can see, see incrementally we are improving survival a little bit. I think this underscores or underestimates the true advances we've made because we are transplanting older patients and more marginal candidates who might not have been transplanted 10 years ago. The outcomes with a lung transplant are dependent somewhat on the, on the underlying primary disease. So you can see IPF here in the black. And over time, IPF patients, and it might just be a function of that patients with IPF tend to be older, don't do quite as well as, say, younger patients with cystic fibrosis. Let me skip through that. One of the controversial issues in transplantation, and certainly with IPF, is what kind of lung transplant? Should you get a single? Should you get a bilateral? And you look at survival curves like this, showing what appears to be a distinct survival advantage to getting two lungs versus singles. But you have to be very careful with these retrospective type of analyses. And this is from our uh, governing body, the International Society for Heart and Lung Transplant, because there is certain bias here. Generally, it's younger patients who, who get the bilaterals versus is older patients who get the singles. So is this a function of other factors rather than the bilateral versus the single? And there have been papers that have concluded um, that uh, singles are better than bilaterals. From this one, bilateral lung transplant appears to offer advantages over single lung transplant for high-risk patients. And the other ones like this one that says survival did not differ between patients who had single and bilateral lung transplant when you control for all these other factors. Uh, and I'll come back to that uh, in a little bit. I think I have another slide attesting to that. Prior to about 2005, lung transplants were allocated on a first-come, first-served basis. And then we have the lung allocation score system that came into effect about 10 years ago, where we try to do uh, a, more, uh, a more fair or equitable distribution of lungs based on need. And this is a concept slide of how the lung allocation score system works. Um, here we have some theoretic patients with the, this is uh, transplant survival or projected transplant su survival, and this is projected mortality without a transplant. So if we were going to transplant patients based on the likelihood of mortality without a transplant, then this patient would get the lung. If we were to transplant patients based on the likelihood of surviving a transplant, then this patient would get the lung. And what we try and do is balance those two and this patient over here has the best combination based on survival models that we have in place of being at the highest risk of dying from the underlying disease within the next year and the, best, uh, uh, the greatest likelihood of surviving a transplant. And that's how the lung allocation score system works. And it really has worked to the advantage of IPF patients because IPF patients tend to score quite high. Um, 
This is um, a, uh, from a paper that our group put together, tapping into the UNOS database, because really the question to ask when you present at a center as a potential lung transplant candidate is not what is my outcome going to be after having a transplant. The question is really what is my outcome going to be after being listed for a transplant. And what we looked at in this particular analysis is likelihood of receiving a transplant if you are listed for a single lung only versus if you're listed for a bilateral only. Because if you're listed for a bilateral only, you have to wait for two good pairs of lungs versus a single, you can take one lung. And in actual fact, what we show over here, if you focus on this, these are the patients who died on the list waiting for a bilateral versus patients who died on the list waiting for a single. So the upshot from this is that any gain you get on the back end of having a transplant might be lost on the waiting list because the likelihood of dying on the waiting list if you are listed for a bilateral only is greater than if you're listed for a single only or if you're listed for a single or bilateral. So that's, I think, important information. Let's move on to the transplant itself. While you are out, we replace your lungs. You wake up and everything's good. You have a new uh, lung or set of lungs. Uh, this gets to the surgery. Uh, different type of surgery. Bilaterals are generally a little bit more complicated. It, it is a bigger surgery. What is important are the structures that are sacrificed as part of the transplant. So the bronchial circulation, some of the blood flow to the lungs, the pulmonary nerves, so you don't have a cough reflex beyond the anastomosis. So any secretions that pull it, normally our inherent cough reflex will kick in and say, got to cough this stuff out. But after a transplant, because there are no ner nerves there, you can have big secretions sitting at the bases that you don't feel and you don't cough out. So this is a, a, a slide of the surgery. There are three basic anastomoses. That's the bronchus, the airway, that's the pulmonary artery, and that's the pulmonary veins. And this is what it looks like in an IPF patient. That's a right single, uh, that's the native lung, and this is the left transplant. You can see a difference in the lung volumes. You can see this diffuse, hazy whitiness, which are the interstitial infiltrates that characterize IPF. So you can see a nice difference between the right lung and the left lung. And this is what the CAT scan looks like. This is the old IPF lung with the fibrotic changes shown here. And this is the good-looking new lung on, this is the right side. It's a delicate balance after transplant. There are many things we have to balance. There's a traditional balance of infection versus rejection. We have to give heavy immunosuppression to prevent rejection, but that increases the risk of infection as well. So a lot of times the tightrope we walk is trying to balance these two opposing forces, not too much in the way of immunosuppression and not too little either because of fear of acute or chronic rejection. There are many other balances as well. Sometimes we try, we will anticoagulate patients after transplant. There is a high risk of uh, thromboembolic events, DVTs, and emboli to the lung. And sometimes we put patients on anticoagulation and they have a bleed. And so this is one of the other balances that we have to play with after transplant. CNR or calcineurin inhibitors, these are some of the immunosuppressive agents we use, otherwise known as FK506 or cyclosporin, and these can cause renal dysfunction. So another balance that we have to play with is using these drugs and not compromising the kidneys. So those are just some of the balances and some of the things that can result in complications after the transplant. We use uh, ge generally three immunosuppressive agents. We are aggressive with our antibiotics, antivirals, and antifungals to prevent infection uh, as we try and negotiate the balance that I spoke about. There are many pulmonary complications that can ensue after transplant, primary graft dysfunction, patients are at risk of early on, pneumonia, fluid around the lungs, pulmonary emboli, acute rejection, uh, problems with the airways, bronchial strictures, which can happen in about 5 to 15% of cases. So these are the kind of things that we watch for. After the first year, the big bugaboo is this term here, BOS, bronchiolitis obliterans syndrome. That's a, that's a form of chronic rejection. And if you look at poor outcomes after transplant after the first year, BOS is the biggest cause of uh, poor outcomes. There's a new acronym in town. It's called CLAD chronic lung allograft dysfunction, and BOS is a subset now of chronic lung allograft dysfunction. So we're changing the nomenclature a little bit around as well. Acute rejection we kind of expect. We see it in most of the patients, so we have a very low threshold for making this diagnosis. And it's not as bad as, my gosh, the lungs are going to jump out of the chest. A lot of times it's very subtle. Patients don't even know about it. We follow patients very closely, and we'll treat 
aggressively with intravenous steroids if we suspect that there might be some acute rejection. Uh, the symptoms and signs can be quite nonspecific. Uh, but generally, our treatment of acute rejection is very good, and patients recover very quickly from that. The big one that I spoke about is bronchiolitis obliterans. Um, it's a form of chronic rejection. It's literally disappearance of the small airways. So as this happens, and the incidence can be as high as around 50% by five years, patients can develop the insidious onset of shortness of breath again. This is something we struggle with in terms of what the cause is. We know that patients who have more episodes of acute rejection are at, are at heightened risk. There are other things like aspiration, infections, and other insults to the lung that can result in chronic rejection down the road. And a lot of times it happens even in the most compliant patients, and patients will come and say, you know, where do we go wrong? What did I do? Well, it's nothing that the patient did wrong. It's nothing that we did wrong. It's through no neglect or otherwise. It's just one of those complications that we don't have a good handle on at this time. This graph shows you um, freedom from bronchiolitis. This is once again from our governing body, ISHLT, and you can see that over time most people will develop some form of acute, uh, uh, sorry, chronic rejection, BOS. Uh, it's not necessarily a death sentence. Uh, there are some patients who walk around and qualify as having BOS but are functionally doing quite well and they can stay stable with stable lung function. BOS is kind of like IPF in that it's very difficult to predict the subsequent course. So if your doctor says to you, you've got some bronchiolitis obliterans syndrome going on, you know, it's not, it's not great, but it doesn't mean that, you know, this is the end of the world, carry on living your life, doing the things that you can and that you're comfortable doing and that what you want to do. Non-pulmonary complications, so sometimes the lungs do great and other things happen, and this is just a list of the other things, kidney disease, diabetes, gastroparesis, that slowing of the stomach so that you have early satiety um, and maybe some fullness and nausea, other endocrine abnormalities, cardiovascular, atrial fibrillation, infections elsewhere can be a problem. VTE is thromboembolism, blood clots that may or may not go to the lungs. Sometimes we struggle with hematologic abnormalities, low white count, anemias, low platelets. PTLD is an acronym for post-transplant lymphoproliferative disease, which is a form of lymphoma that we can see. And then patients are at heightened risk of malign malignancy as well. As we knock down the immune system, the propensity to develop malignancies is also increased. There, I'm not going to belabor on, on the, this slide, but there are many causes of mortality after transplant. As mentioned, bronchiolitis is the big one after the first year. But there are many different things that can cause or be problematic and result in the demise of a transplant recipient. The key to success is uh, constant vigilance, which involves frequent clinic visits, uh, PFTs, which generally we have patients do at home by themselves, sometimes frequent bronchoscopy to keep a watch on what's going on in the lung. Sometimes things can happen in the native lung that can be problematic. A lot of times we deal with complications from the medications. These medications are not risk-free. They may result in diabetes, hypertension, renal insufficiency, and so there are many different elements to the holistic care of a transplant recipient. One of the nice things about doing a single lung is you can see how the native lung evolves over time. And I always say when I, follow, when I show two slides like this, this is the native side and this is a transplant. This is a transplant over here. You can see the distinct difference. This enables us to follow the natural history of the disease, RPF, beyond the natural history of the patient because we know that this patient wouldn't be alive with two lungs like this or two lungs like this. So the disease does tend to progress in the native lung over time. So as you can gather from this, transplant is a fine balancing act and there are many different elements that we have to balance. This is a, it's a very important uh, uh, paradigm that the patients work very closely with their providers and the caregivers in terms of taking care of, of, of the lungs. There's a, a lot at stake when we do a lung transplant in any individual patient, and this is a discussion I often have with patients, is it's not only you we're talking about, we're also talking about the donor and the donor families. We have to make sure we do the best job with the lung or the lungs that we're giving you. And then we also owe a responsibility to other patients on the transplant list. Uh, we're not going to transplant someone who is uh, predestined to have a poor outcome because that's denying someone else the opportunity to get those same lungs. So I'll end off by asking the same question I did beforehand, who still wants to have a lung transplant? <laughs>
Okay, so I didn't talk many people out of it. I, I, I hope I haven't been too negative about it. This is a kind of presentation I would give to physicians as well. This is just the, the honest uh, truth, and this is a type of education we need to give patients so that they know what they're getting themselves into. We've had some fabulous outcomes. We've saved many lives, especially of IPF patients with transplant, and I think the patients in the audience can attest to that as well. So thank you very much.